Uh, hello, uh, welcome again to, uh, to this conference. I'm uh, David Sweener. I'm on the board of SCORE. Um, it is wonderful to be back in, uh, in Athens. I mean, as a Canadian, where we have a history of designating buildings as historical before they're 50 years old, coming to Athens puts that in perspective. Um, and uh, for those of you who are watching this online, I can just tell you the venue here is spectacular. Uh, you've really missed out by not being here in person. Uh, it is uh, an amazing, amazing building. And uh, being on the top floor with the view over uh, Athens and the harbor is extraordinary. Uh, it is my pleasure to be introducing our keynote speaker, Maria Glover. Uh, Maria is somebody that I've now known for, for several years. And starting, I know, I'm trying to remember, Maria, how, how many years ago it was that we co-authored a couple of uh, op-eds for media in New Zealand. And I don't think I ever told you, but I, I heard from some of our tobacco control colleagues after they were published that... Why are you writing things with her? She challenges the status quo on this and gets people upset. And I thought, well, you just answered your own question. That's why you write things with people like Mariwa, because she is challenging the status quo, and the status quo is 8 million deaths a year. Uh, we do need to challenge that. So Mariwa is somebody who's had her uh, PhD, University of Auckland, I think 21 or so years ago, and she is focused on... The, the people who are most disadvantaged, uh, she has actually done something that we would call public health, which is that she seeks to understand people's lived experience, and she tries to meet them where they are in order to understand what you can do to better their situation and to empower them to make better decisions about their own health. And, you know, that's what public health is about, and it does challenge assumptions and coming from New Zealand, uh, being Maori, having that background, has given her a perspective many people don't have. And I, I think it's, it's really important as we look at what's going on in New Zealand, and New Zealand, like Japan and Norway and Sweden, are seen as great success stories on harm reduction. But is it that they've reached where we need to get, or that they've just done a little bit better than other countries? Is it that these are like an athletic team that's able to really do great things, or is it that we're dealing with a competition where everybody's had their legs and arms bound and somebody suddenly has a free arm? I mean, that looks really great compared to the other athletes, but what more could you accomplish if we unbound you know, legs and arms? So, Mariwa, over to you, uh, and I know that you've already testified in front of a committee in New Zealand today, you've testified in Malaysia, it's getting late at night in Auckland, and you need to head to Washington soon, so we appreciate you being, being available and uh, look forward to what you have to say. Oh, thank you very much, David. It's lovely to see you again, and I'm sure I'll see you again in Washington, hopefully. <laughs> and thank you so much uh, to the conference for having me to speak. Uh, first, my... Oh, <laughs> my, oh, there we go, sorry, my disclosures. So I have never received any funding from any tobacco or vaping company. Uh, over 10 years ago, I did receive some funding or just payments really for advice on uh, smoking cessation medications. My research center is funded by a grant from the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. Uh, under that grant, uh, my work is editorially independent. So now to New Zealand's push to control smoking. For other countries looking to New Zealand as a model to follow, it is important to understand that the New Zealand government began interventions to reduce smoking prevalence 77 years ago in 1945. Firstly, with health education, and that's an old ad printed in the paper. And 17 years later, industry implemented voluntary restrictions on advertising and marketing. In 1963, tobacco product advertising was banned on TV and radio. 
16 years after that, in 1979, we began taxing tobacco. Another decade later, in 1999, in 1990, sorry, New Zealand was the first country in the world to implement a comprehensive Smoke-Free Environments Act. The intention of that act was to reduce the harm of smoking. Over the next 30 years, several more amendments to the law saw smoking banned in more and more areas, including some outdoor areas. Stigmatizing mass media campaigns, decade long programs of tax increases and progressively restrictive tweaks on marketing, display, packaging and the use of cigarettes. Each amendment set a precedent for a following more radical step. It wasn't until the turn of the century that free smoking cessation support was finally funded. Subsidized nicotine re replacement therapy wasn't funded until 2006. When I started work in tobacco control in 1993, the average smoking prevalence for 15 years and above was 27%. This is way lower than many current day smoking prevalence rates in many countries. And that was 30 years ago. The harm reduction approach at the time was focused on reducing uptake of smoking, reducing consumption and reducing prevalence. Now, people began vaping in New Zealand in about 2011. Just some, some outliers, some, you know, early adopters, but it soon spread. Now, this figure shows that current smoking prevalence reduced from 18.4% in 2011-12 to 10.9% in 2020-21. Daily smoking, which is the darker blue line, it floats around about 2% lower. That reduced from 16.4% in 2011-12 to 9.4% in 2021. And the brown lines there show you uh, current and daily vaping. And you can see this perfect displacement curve happening there. Uh, when they started to record that, not until really 2017-18. Now, smoking in New Zealand varies greatly, and probably in many other countries, by income level. This figure shows that in 2021, daily smoking among the richest two-fifths of New Zealanders, the quintiles one to two, was already down to or below the aspirational goal government had set to reach 5% or below smoking prevalence. Smoking is disproportionately higher among the poorest people in society. Wide, disparity, wide disparities also still exist between the numerically and politically dominant New Zealand European people and the indigenous Māori. So the top two lines, that's uh, Māori men in orange and Māori women in grey. Consistent with stats, over the last 30 years, Māori women still have the highest smoking prevalence rates. But note the more rapid decline since vaping was introduced in 2015 and the even sharper fall since the government vaping regulation was mooted in 2019. Interventions to reduce smoking must seek to reduce such inequities. It is particularly important that these inequities are eliminated before thinking about imposing criminalizing policies that could worsen socioeconomic disparities, a very driver of smoking. And the more general drive 
to psychoactive substances for relief from marginalization and disadvantage. The vaping regulation signaled a shift from harm reduction, a harm reduction focus at least, to prohibition, from a focus on improving health to a morally based form of social engineering. Though looked up to as progressive and an exemplar for other countries to imitate, I recommend you stick to a public health approach, not a moral pseudo-religious one. The law amended the intention of the original 1990 Smoke-Free Environments Act. The intention, and you can see the wording there, taken from the Act, is now to denormalize vaping, prevent the normalization of vaping, and ensure no one starts or ever returns to smoking, vaping, or using heated tobacco products. Towards the complete elimination of any tobacco or nicotine product use, the law encourages people to stop smoking, vaping, or using heated tobacco products. But the law directs the machinery of government to, quote, encourage people to stop such behavior. This quote from a member of parliament at the time of uh, one of the 2020 amendments reveals they know what they are doing. She said, we are now making sure that our cars will be vape free. And why? Because fundamentally, we want to denormalize both smoking and vaping. While acknowledging that vaping is better than smoking, vaping isn't good either. Before the rapid displacement of smoking by vaping has had a chance to all but eliminate smoking, a blatantly prohibitionist law is now being pushed through Parliament. This law proposes to, one, cap the amount of nicotine in smoked tobacco products at a sub-functional level. The level isn't stipulated in the wording of the Act, but below 0.05 milligrams per gram yield is what is being talked about. Secondly, the Act proposes to reduce the number of tobacco retailers across the country, a country the size of Japan, but with a population of only 5 million, from about 8,000 to 500 to 1,000 retailers across the country. And the third policy, which is getting most of the coverage around the world, is to impose a sinking lid on the legal age of purchase. Our current legal age of purchase is 18. Starting in 2027, the age would be raised by one year every year. If denicotinization goes through, the other two policies are redundant. They are just virtue signaling. The worry is that there are no real life trials or evidence about what will happen if this policy is passed and no one seems to care. It is prohibition and prohibition is not consistent with harm reduction. It is top down versus person centered. It is punitive. It is not compassionate. And it will likely increase harm harm due to increased injury associated with black market activity and criminalization of people caught breaching the law. And the fines that are being proposed are pretty hefty. 
people with higher dependency on smoking, such as people with mental health conditions, drug and alcohol comorbidity, the most socially deprived and marginalized who have disproportionately higher smoking rates will be more likely to suffer the negative consequences. And this will exacerbate social disparities. There also could be a shift to higher risk substance abuse. The challenges for countries wanting to reduce smoking related harm include the prolific and widespread campaign of disinformation misleading people about the relative risk of nicotine. Loss of academic freedom is preventing scientists from hearing or reading the truth. The rise of liberal paternalism will see these same strategies used to stop other bad behaviors prohibitionist public health academics want to get rid of. Diminishment of human rights to autonomy, dignity, and the right to consent, for example, to medical intervention, has much wider societal implications. In conclusion, don't forget the historical context. It took New Zealand a generation to get to where we are today. Other countries haven't even done half the groundwork that we have done. Don't forget the social context as well, the different uh, ethnic makeups, the disparities per country. Time and products have changed. There is now a practical strategy acceptable to the consumer that could all but eliminate smoking across the world. Beware of the lies and propaganda campaigns demanding prohibition. Beware policies for which there is no real life scientific trials that record the adverse effects and consequences of policies. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really telling to be able to hear what's happening in New Zealand because as you can see, in, in many ways it's a great success story, but in so many other ways there's so much farther to go. And I, I think Mariwa did a, a wonderful job of, of summing that up, that you know, we can see how smoking rates fell more rapidly as vaping became available. But then we also see this sort of uh, knee-jerk reaction that what we need are prohibitionist strategies. We need coercion rather than, again, the public health principles of empowerment, of uh, you know, informing people, of, of giving people viable options, uh, working with them, understanding their lived experience. Uh, it's now open for, uh, for questions, and Mariwa, if you can just stay up a little later tonight in New Zealand to, uh, to answer these, it'll be uh, appreciated. So anybody who's uh, watching online can send in questions, and apparently they will come up on this tablet I have. Uh, and anybody in the audience here, uh, uh, please just uh, indicate your interest and we'll get a microphone to you. Uh, and in the meantime, I can start with the first one, which is purposely difficult, which is given the experience you've had, how rapidly do you think we could reduce cigarette smoking uh, in a place like New Zealand that's, that's already accomplished quite a lot if we used... Uh, a fuller range of the sorts of measures you're talking about, of if we gave people more options, if we gave them better information, if we used risk proportionate regulation, if, 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 if we were empowering people who are currently using nicotine to, to get it in, in far safer ways. What do you think we could accomplish in the next five years? Well, given that uh, some people are already 5% or below. I mean, it's really the people in the, in the higher smoking um, groups that will take longer. Unfortunately, the anti-vaping disinformation campaigns are quite rife here as well, are creating a lot of panic around youth vaping. And there's a mixed message going out 
uh, even the government's vaping regulation embedded that mixed message. We want you to do this, but it's also not good for you. So a lot of our participants in our Voices of the 5% study, uh, you know, they, they repeat that back and they still smoke. So we could have reduced smoking prevalence a lot faster if people had been told the, rel the truth about the relative risk of vaping compared to smoking. We could have reduced the smoking prevalence much faster if the oral nicotine pouches had not been banned in that vaping regulation that passed. We have heated tobacco products, but uh, advertising is banned. So very few people actually know they're available or what they are. The vaping regulation also banned kind of uh, consumer support groups online, for example. And they were incredibly important 24-7 peer-to-peer support on how to switch from smoking to vaping. And under the Vaping Regulation Act, they are not allowed to talk or give advice on how to quit smoking using vaping. So the vaping regulation looks great. It was great, but it had these embedded undermining parts to it, which is slowing things down. Uh, th thank you. I, I uh, open to uh, to questions here, and what Maria has said is is very much like uh, we've experienced in Canada and seen so many other other countries. Uh, get a microphone. Uh, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. It's uh, Dr. Economides. I would like to ask you, what is in New Zealand, what is the situation, what, uh, what is the position and the thoughts of the medical societies regarding vaping or novel smoking products? Are they are pro, cons? What's the situation there? I would say there is majority support for people to switch from smoking to vaping. There are only two organizations, non-government organizations, that are behind the campaign of disinformation. That is the Asthma and Respiratory Foundation and the Cancer Society. And the Cancer Society, it's as if there's, you know, a web of cancer societies around the world. They all stay in touch and share the same strategies. And... Uh, and both, both organizations are heavily funded by pharmaceutical companies who have really taken a huge hit as people are using vaping and not the nicotine replacement therapies, not the smoking cessation medications. Thank you. We have another, I think you had somebody with a question back here. Thank you. Christopher Rooney from uh, Denmark, Philip Morris. Uh, in Denmark, the uh, government seems to be quite inspired by uh, the uh, government in New Zealand. And um, uh, the government in Denmark seems to be more dogmatic than the government in New Zealand, however. Uh, we've been trying to uh, get that into the uh, discussion because we've seen that the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has mentioned positively the possibility of switching from cigarettes to vaping. But basically you're saying that this is not what is really going on, that the government in New Zealand isn't positive with regard to, to vaping, or can you elaborate on that a bit more? Yes, they, the government is supportive, and, and both the ministers of health, associate ministers of health, and the prime minister have made public statements encouraging people who smoke to switch to vaping. They really had to because of the disinformation campaigns that were putting people off. And the, camp, the government is running a switch to vaping campaign on TV, a mass media campaign. So as I said, a majority uh, of the health establishment 
are supportive. They see their own patients stopping smoking. Many people are stopping smoking. There is concern about young people taking up vaping. And as we've seen in the U US and some other countries, the, the youth that take it up out of curiosity um, and it being a fad, that will fade. And, and we already are seeing vaping dropping among young people in New Zealand. It's really only going to be the young people who were going to smoke, uh, who are using drugs, who are... Uh, who had already started smoking and have switched to vaping, that will continue to vape. But there is quite a lot of media coverage. The uh, Asthma and Respiratory Foundation have been lobbying all of the schools and spreading misinformation about, as I said, nicotine, uh, addiction, uh, anything they can do to increase the uh, lobbying effort to have vaping included in this next legislation. They want to see the same kinds of measures applied to vaping already. We haven't got there yet, and I don't know that we ever need to get there. People are always uh, going to use, some people are always going to look to a psychoactive substance to relieve their stress and life circumstances. We need to be considering the place of vaping amongst the whole spectrum of psychoactive substances that people might turn to. Thank you, and we have... Yes, thank you. Uh, Rafael Castillo from uh, the Philippines, thank you so much for the uh, valuable insights and guidance uh, you have presented based on real world uh, experience, particularly in New Zealand. Uh, it cannot be overemphasized that I think the greatest struggle or, or challenge that uh, we're encountering right now is the misinformation on, 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 on the impact of nicotine, you know, implicating it as the, 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 this whole culprit uh, in, in cigarette smoking and demeaning the role so, of alternative tobacco products in weaning patients uh, of uh, cigarette uh, sp smoking. Uh, I believe the biggest antidote would be uh, to keep on producing evidence that uh, uh, the, the introduction of uh, alternative tobacco products are, are really creating a solitary impact in really uh, effectively uh, reducing the prevalence of smoking uh, in, in, in various countries where ATPs are, are liberally allowed or given access to, particularly to current uh, smokers. So. Uh, I think uh, you know the, it's 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 our best bet uh, at the moment so that we can really address this um, misinformation and it will come up to a point when there is no denying anymore because they cannot ref they cannot uh, refute success I mean they cannot argue with success and the moment uh, we've reached such a point that uh, we've shown enough data it based on real world uh, experiences and evidences. I think the naysayers will start to uh, keep maintain their peace. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, and congratulations to you in the Philippines for the passage of your uh, vaping regulation. And I and I hope we see the same effect there. And uh, and I agree with you. And um, just on that point of naysayers, we have had several who were very very anti vaping. Um, change their position here in New Zealand. So um, we can only hope that that continues as if people get access to and are allowed to read and think for themselves about the scientific evidence coming out. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a truism that people can only make as good a decision as the information available to them allows. And it's simply unfair to fail to give people the information they need to make an informed decision, and then hold them responsible for having made a, a bad decision. Like, you know, you now have an illness, it's your fault, rather than we failed to tell you what you could have done to prevent this from happening to you. Uh, we may have time for another question or two if we're uh, very quick. And if I stop interrupting and giving my views on things.
Seina Boussal for All Africa Media. Uh, I have a, a question for the LMI LMICs. Uh, what is your vision in terms of regulation and uh, access to information for those countries? Yes, so in talking about how long it took for New Zealand to reach where we are, I think that there is a real risk for low middle income countries and, and, and countries of different cultures where the use of extremely punitive prohibition policies is, is common. Um, like we have seen in some countries, I think it was Thailand, where people were being arrested for, you know, you could be, you could be put in jail for 10 years for having uh, vaping equipment or for vaping. So what, what we have done in New Zealand and what has worked in New Zealand shouldn't automatically be imposed or be thought that it could work the same way in a low middle income country that hasn't done the health education. So where you have a country, for instance, in India, where the widespread knowledge among the public that smoking kills, that smoking is extremely dangerous to health, and or that uh, chewing, the chewing tobacco products that are available in some of those countries is also uh, carries a high risk to health, oral health and uh, cancers. Where the public don't understand that yet, I think that it's forgotten that we did that work and that lays the groundwork for the many, many, many policies that we have trialled and shown the way of. To impose these extremely punitive and prohibitive uh, policies on a country that hasn't educated their public yet about the harms of smoking. I think that's wrong. You know, other countries need the time and need the resources and the support from countries like New Zealand, US, UK and others to do that work, do that first. And you will see that many people given the truth and educated about the harms, how the harms actually do harm. They'll make their own choice to stop or to switch to something less uh, risky. Right, and, and I just add that there, there's, we've gone through some of this before on technology in low and middle income countries. It wasn't actually all that long ago that people said that you're never going to be able to have telephones in a lot of these countries because we lack sufficient copper resources to have sufficient copper wire to set up telephone systems. Uh, not that long ago, uh, I was in a meeting in Washington where somebody said, no, these alternatives to cigarettes, it, it's, there's technology in these things. Um, it'll be very hard for people to get it. it. It's like smartphones. People in third world countries will never be able to afford smartphones. Uh, and we see how rapidly that changes. You know, there's hundreds of millions of potential customers. What might happen? What can we do? Can we speed up the transformation, the information that Maria has talked about? I think, uh, uh, unfortunately for us, probably fortunately for Maria, in order for her to get some sleep tonight, uh, we've, uh, we've come to the end of this. I want to thank you very, very much for participating. I'm sorry you're not here in person. It would have been wonderful to have you join me in my long walk around Athens yesterday as I dealt with jet lag. Uh, I look forward to helping you deal with jet lag in Washington next week, another nice city to walk around. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you very much.